Welcome to Conversations with Peter Bogosian. I am here with the man, the myth, the legend, Gad Sad. And I will say it's quite a trip to walk around with Gad Sad because all these people approach him and, and <laughs> want to talk to him. It's true. It's true. And uh, we haven't I haven't seen you since the pandemic. And I no. want to I want to publicly thank you now. I, I know that I've thanked you privately for this, but I want to publicly thank you. I it's kind of hard for me to talk about, but when I last saw you in person, my dad had just died and it was, you were just, it was just like amazing. Like I need, you're a tonic. Like I, I totally needed to spend oh. that time with you. Incredibly grateful for that. So thank you, buddy. Thank you. How, how are you? I mean, we never get over such a loss, but are you, are you feeling generally a bit better? Well, I mean, I think about my parents every day. I think about my grandparents are every day. I think about the people I love every day. Obviously, it's not something you can get over. My my mentor said to me that this is the way. It, that this is actually a good thing because it's the natural order of things. What you don't want is the kids to die before the parents. And so, so that was uh, comforting to me. Well, you, uh, Professor Sad, if I may call you Gad, please. Uh, so Gad, you have another amazing book uh, on, on happiness. And so I just wanted to ask you some questions about the book. Cause I'm sure people are curious about it and eager for it. So why did you want to focus on happiness of all the things that you could have focused on? Yeah. Well, first, thank you for having me on. It's so good to see you again. Uh, our, our trip to Las Vegas has become legendary in, in our, <laughs> in my home where my wife says, so you go with Pete Bogosian and hang out and have fun and eat all kinds of great food in Las oh, Vegas. Yeah. You don't take yeah, me. Great. So I think she might be jealous of our little sorti in Las Vegas. But any case, the reason why I wrote happiness, it, 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 it wasn't something that was on my radar, Pete. So if you would have asked yeah. me when The Parasitic Mind came out, what's my next book going to be about? I, I, would, I would be lying to you if I said, oh, the next book is going to be about happiness. Uh -huh. what, what made me write it are really two, two things, two factors. Number one, many people would write to me and say, how come you deal with all of these serious topics all the time? And yet you always seem to be fun and playful and you're joking and there's a twinkle in your eye. What's your secret to your happiness, professor? So that was number one. Number two, whenever I would, you know, I operate, Pete, uh, as an academic psychologist in, in descriptive world, meaning I, I try to understand scientifically and describe behavior. I don't operate in prescriptive world, as say with Jordan Peterson, who's a clinical psychologist. He's prescribing people the optimal path to take to solve problem X. And so, but whenever I would post a tweet that was prescriptive in nature, where I'm offering advice, he, here is my secret to how I lost a lot of weight, and here is how you can do it too, that I noticed that that was some of the most powerful and viral and influential content that I was posting because people, they trust you, they, they respect your, your expertise. And so I thought, okay, well, people want to know why I'm happy. People seem to trust my opinion on important things. Why don't I take a crack at putting it all together in a book, which is a mixture of my personal anecdotes with ancient wisdoms, backed up by contemporary science, put it all together. Hopefully there's a good book. But bef before I cede the floor back to you, it was really daunting for me because yeah. probably the topic that has been most covered by philosophers for the past several thousand years is treaties on how to live the good life. So I was worried at first, you know, am I going to have something fresh, insightful and unique to say? And if I've done a good job, the answer is yes. So let's drill down on that uh, because I think it's really important to give a definition. So what do you mean when you say happiness? Like, how do you define that? Yes, beautiful. Uh, so the best way that I can answer that question is to use a you know neuro uh, transmitter model, if you'd like. So dopamine is the pleasure center reacting, right? So I just bought a new Aston Martin. I could say to you, "Oh, that I'm really happy about that." But that's a ephemeral dopamine hit, or I just bought the new watch that I wanted, or you know whatever. Th those are pleasure seeking pursuits which is not at all what i mean by happiness so to continue with the the the, the framework of you know the the neuroanatomy framework serotonin is contentment right it's me sitting on the proverbial porch and at the age of 85 next to my spouse who's we've been together for 50 years and we look at each other and say you know what 
We've raised an amazing family. We've had a strong marriage. I could look back at my profession. It has offered me endless opportunities for purpose and meaning. And, and I go down that list. And I say, it's been a good life. So I mean happiness in that sense, an existential bliss and sense of contentment. So there's, so I'm thinking about it in terms of immediacy. So you're not talking about like the dopamine hit. You're not talking about the crack hit or every day when I have a cup of coffee, I, I, I drink this uh, cold brew or nitro cold brew from one of my favorite places. It's it, So you're talking about, so let me, so would that kind of happiness, as Aristotle says, would that be a byproduct of self-discipline, hard work, et cetera? Like the example you use, like raising a family? Right. So it, I'm going to answer that question using the language of evolutionary psychology, which is my main area of academic research. Yeah. So there isn't a domain general mechanism that's built into our brain that says, seek happiness. Rather, there are domain specific, evolutionarily relevant domain specific goals, which if approached properly, the downstream effect will be that I'm happy. So find mate is a, is a domain specific computational system that I've evolved an, an exact computational system to solve that problem because it is a recurring evolutionary problem. Now, if I make that mate choice wisely, then I can pretty much guarantee that that's going to increase the likelihood of me having a happy life. And I could apply it for many other evolutionary relevant goals. So it's not that there is this general mechanism called seek happiness, or to put it another way, Viktor Frankl, I have his book here. So of course, for well, meaning. exactly. So he's got a quote, which I use in the last chapter of my book, where he basically says, you know, you don't go after success willfully. I mean, I'm paraphrasing what he said. Yeah. Rather, success is the byproduct, is the outcome of you having made some good decisions. Well, I say that exactly applies to happiness. There is a set of decisions and mindsets, which if I approach properly, the downstream effect will be that it increases my chances of happiness. So that's interesting. And so in your book, you write about m marriage. And I've seen a lot of people tweet about the the married people live longer. I've also read something that marriage is becoming increasingly something for the upper middle classes, some of the middle classes and the upper class. It's becoming a class-based idea. Um, so, and then you write about, so what are the, 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 the most central factors or some central factors in how to, how to, how to make a marriage work? Yes. So b before answering necessarily how to make it work is how do we choose the right one. So, which yes, is, I yes, guess is much better, to, much right? better. Yeah. So here I'm going to use two maxims from evolutionary psychology. Mm -hmm. There is the opposites attract maxim, and then there's the birds of a feather flock together maxim. And it turns out, Pete, that for the research is unequivocal about this, that for the long term, the, the, increasing your probability for the long term success of your marriage, it's overwhelmingly the birds of a feather Birds of a feather flock together maxim that is operative. Now, the next question, of course, becomes, well, but birds of a feather flocking on which feathers? Uh, you know, how We're sorting on which traits. Is it that we should have the same eye color, the same hair color? And of course not. It's we should assort on key foundational life values, right? So take an example. I think offline we were talking about some atheism issues that you had taught yeah. Let's, let's suppose I am a highly uh, religious person where every decision that I make in my life is rooted in my faith. And the prospective person that I wish to potentially marry is someone who is a rather caustic atheist. Well, it doesn't take a fancy psychologist to say that we're really starting off on the, the wrong footing, that the likelihood of us having fissures in our marriage are inherently increased by by virtue of us having that fundamental difference so if you can start off life having those cultural uh similarities those uh value similarities belief similarities then you're increasing your chances of being successful and i'll personalize it to my own life i've been with my wife for 23 years uh she happens to be lebanese as as i am although Neither of us necessarily said a priori we only want to marry Lebanese people, but the one of the factors I think that made it easy for us to 
to uh, to be attracted to one another is that we understand the same cultural compass points. We we uh, we have similar right. So some of the jokes that I might have made with her parents when I first met them might not have gone over well with a with a family from Nebraska. Not that they are any less nice or whatever, but th those things matter. Oftentimes, people think that you know the 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 libidinal drive of the early marriage when we we are having sex all the time and are, we're getting butterflies and our fingers are getting tingly that's going to propel you for a 50 year marriage it, it doesn't right yes you can always be attracted to your partner but that particular stage will dissipate and you need to have a lot more to sustain a long term happy marriage yeah that's interesting in candid conversations i've had with my friends and I don't usually talk about these things with my friends there, there does well with anybody for that matter, there, there does seem to be a uh, downslope to, as you say, the libidinous activities. <laughs> uh, um, and I'm wondering if the birds of a feather, just the similarities can bind people together in such a way that offsets that, you know, like if, if people have, if their values comport with each other. I've also been thinking a little bit about that example that you used about atheism and Christianity. And I have a, a very good friend, very, very good friend who's an atheist and her probably lifelong partner will be a Christian. And I wonder if a lot of that is just cultural, like, and I think in the 2010s that would have mattered more than it does in the 2023. So I wonder if there's a cultural element to that. Do you think? You, uh, you mean in the fact that there might be an incongruity between one person being very religious and the other not being yeah. religious? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, to the extent you you would know this data better than I would, uh, Pete, but has has the number of atheists longitudinally increased over the past 10 years? Yes, it's Jerry Coyne writes about that in his last book. And what, how, how, like, what was it at 10 years ago, roughly? What is it? Is it like 10% or 15%? Yeah, I don't know. The, the, I can't remember the, the, the stats off the top of my head. Uh, but the, it's fallen in all categories. It's risen outside of the U.S. with Islam. And even within the United States, it's fallen the nuns. Uh, but the degree of um, extreme religiosity has fallen as well. So it's oh. fallen in all categories domestically. In Interesting. Well, I do. Since we're on the topic of religion, uh, in one of the chapters, I have, uh, you know, the correlates of happiness across many, many areas. So how does personality affect happiness? How does culture affect happiness? How does health affect happiness? And so I have a section, a small section on religiosity and happiness. And it may or may not surprise your viewers and listeners that there is a uh, a small but but significant positive correlation between religiosity and happiness, meaning that those who are more religious on average are somewhat happier. Now, there could be very clear, as, as I'm sure you know this, Pete. But I was just going to jump in on that, but go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say there are very, very earthly reasons why that might be the exactly. case. In other words, yeah. it doesn't. The, the explanation doesn't have to be new to, uh, rooted in a supernatural narrative exactly. because... By being religious, there's greater communality, there's greater uh, cohesion, there's greater in-group, out-group demarcation that allows us to engage with reciprocal arrangements with the in-group members. So there are very earthly reasons by which religious endeavors will create you know, greater bonding and so on, and hence make me happier, which speaks to a more general point. I'm, I'm jumping to another, but sure, a later sure. point. It turns out, so this is, this is a study, Pete, that has been ongoing. I think it might be the longest existing longitudinal active study in the world. It's been going on for eight plus decades out of Harvard uh, that looks at what are the causative factors of well-being over the... Oh, long yes, time. yes. You know this yeah. one, right? Yeah. And guess what the number one factor is? Quality of social relationships more than anything else. So much so that when you're in your 80s, the the predictive, you know, power of the quality of the social relationships you have is greater than the cholesterol scores you had in your 50s and on. So, you know, yes, worry about your cholesterol or your blood pressure, of course, but just having either a good band of friends that you could trust who are around you, who have your back, 
serves yeah. as an incredible protective belt, both to your physical and mental well-being. Yeah, Aristotle writes about that, and it has a pedigree in the literature. And anecdotally, I've certainly found that to be true, the satisfaction that I have from... But it's, for me, it, you know, I don't know why I'm thinking about Aristotle. I haven't read Aristotle in a long time. But you know, he talks about these degrees or levels of friendship. And, uh, you know, the lowest one is, you know, like someone's your cousin. And then right up from that, like you have the same hobbies. I like jujitsu. Someone else likes jujitsu. And then right up from that is uh, two people like to have, you know, conversations, good conversations. So the person's a good conversationalist. And then the highest level, which I've been thinking about for years, is a friendship of virtue. And yes. like, I, I think in my own life, I've tried to move all of my friendships to friendships of virtue. I mean, it's hard, but, it, it, but you know, basically, you know, when you tell somebody something that may hurt their, you risk hurting someone's feelings because you want to tell someone something because you think it's in their own good and they don't, it doesn't question the ground of a friendship or if two, two people are virtuous people, the likelihood that those people can can have a more meaningful substantive friendship and i i think what like if you were to somehow i don't know how you would test this i don't know how you'd operationalize it but get more granular on that data i bet i bet it's not just the having people you get together with beers for once in a week or playing dungeons and dragons i'm sure that would have something to do with it but i think it's the quality of those interactions too you, oh 100 percent. look yeah. i i know to, so i can i can confirm what you just said not only in the context of friendships and how you know what kind of taxonomy of friendships you might create, as you just mentioned regarding Aristotle, but even for example, in the quality of conversations I have had since the book was released. So my yeah. wife will come to me sometimes and say, "So how was how was the the, the host on this particular show?" I say, "Oh, he, he's lovely, but it was very surface." Whereas someone else who she wouldn't have expected I might have something nice to say about them but just because I didn't know them or I wasn't familiar with them. I say, you yeah. know what? This person really came prepared. They knew what they were talking about. And we had this like orgiastic tango of ideas floating. And, and I come away from that conversation feeling very, very in, in, invigorated, even though I didn't know this person. So I don't think what you just said only applies to friendship. It applies to all of these dyadic relationships. Yeah, so I guess how I guess the question is you don't cultivate them because you want to be happy. You cultivate them because I I was going to say because it leads to a good life. So so the, I guess the question then becomes what's the relationship between happiness and a good life and can you have a good life and not be happy? Like let's say for example that you did something that was incredibly socially meaningful like you helped homeless drug addicts and you ameliorated suffering of, you know, countless people, but you really hated doing it. It made you miserable, but you did it out of a sense of duty because you thought it was the right thing to do. I mean, clearly there has to be some, or does there have to be some kind of relationship between happiness and a good life? Okay. So, I mean, I understood the, the example that you gave where you're helping tons of people, but you're not enjoying doing it. But in general, I would think notwithstanding that example where you pitted the two against each other, in general, would they not go hand in hand to the point of almost being synonymous? That does, does, does it, is it not the case that happiness in the way that I've defined it, which is this kind of existential happiness sitting on the porch when you're 85, isn't that the same as having led a good life, generally speaking? Yeah, I, I have to say I have a, a, a conspicuous fear in my head and that fear is a fear of moral epistemology. In other words, you've become really happy doing the wrong things. You've become really happy by throwing Jews in ovens. You've become really happy because, <laughs> right? So so it would seem to me that the epistemology would have to precede that and any sense of happiness you could get by doing something you thought would be good or discharging a moral duty because it should be discharged and there was a byproduct of happiness what would have to precede that is some kind of moral epistemology. Like you'd have to have some way to figure out if the thing you were doing is a thing you should be doing. And if that were sound, then you could say that the steps that you took to lead to that, which caused your own happiness and facilitated the good life comport with each yeah. other. Spoken like a former professor of philosophy. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, if we're going to get philosophical at that level, 
I would say, although what I'm about to say doesn't apply to all people and certainly okay. may not apply to most of the listeners, uh, although certainly the ancient Greeks might agree with what I'm saying, I think that it's very difficult to lead a maximally happy and good life if it doesn't have cerebral pursuits at the center of that trajectory. Okay, I'm so happy you said that. Okay, so I've been thinking about this for a long time. I actually read a book that one of my friends I consider to be a friend of virtue, Matt, Matt Thornton. I wrote the the um, the afterward to his his just released book, The Gift of Violence. He gave me a book on uh, the in defense of elitism, and I was thinking about this. This is like. It, something that I I'm hesitant to say, but it certainly seems true to me that certain people have a capacity for the kind of happiness that you described, which would be linked to their intelligence. Like if somebody just wasn't that intelligent and m maybe you could just operationalize and say IQ under 81, because that's the thing, that's the cutoff that Peter Singer and Peterson, et cetera, are talking about. Um, you know, maybe that they could get short-term immediate ha happiness, or maybe they could even get more short-term immediate happiness from a person with a higher IQ. But it does seem to, that intelligence has to have some relationship to happiness, not directly causal. I don't know, maybe like overlapping Venn diagrams, but wouldn't it be the case that a more intelligent person in general, or maybe you can leave out in general, has a greater capacity for happiness? That, so I don't know if that research has been done. Just the link between, let's say, general IQ and happiness, I, I wouldn't be able to say. Now, the reason why when I started my point, when I said you can't really have a full trajectory of a good life without having cerebral pursuits, and I, yeah. when I started that, I said it may not apply to many people. Here, I wasn't trying to ex exclude some people as being too dumb to instantiate that goal. I was. Not, I, I was. Yeah, no, I know, I know. But, but... No, I get that, but it's because <laughs> it because I think many people don't have the profundity or depth to pursue that. So I think there are, a, and by the way, that's the distinction between what I call true intellectuals and many of our colleagues, professors who are anything but intellectual, yeah. right? So, so Christopher Hitchens did not have a PhD. He was yeah. not a professor, but he was an intellectual in the true old sense of the term. He could talk about uh, the aesthetics of art, or he could talk to you about the, the, the pros and cons of invading Iraq. He wasn't a hyper-specialist as is typically selected for in academia, where you know a lot about one small thing and take me out of that lane and I'm a baffling, uh, you know, babbling idiot. So yeah. for me, when I say... I understand that most people are not going to be able to instantiate these higher cerebral pursuits. Yeah. It, it's really a, a testament to the fact, to the regrettable fact, that too many people are not profound enough. And that I often tell my children, I try to cultivate in them a, a sense of, you know, the, the love of intellectualism by trying to get them. And it's it's hard, as you know, because you also have, you know, they're a bit older, your children, but also yeah. young, young children. It, you have to read. I mean, the, the, the hundred. Oh my God. I'm so happy. The number that, one. I mean, 100%. listen, exactly. Right. I mean, for me, just two days ago, Peter, uh, uh, or, or Pete more, whatever it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, I was, I think walking back with my daughter, I can't remember what, what the context was. I said, and she said, what's, what's wrong, daddy? And I was like, oh, I've got, so, I've got this, I've got that. And then I stopped for a second and I thought, you know what, sweetie, I'm, I'm speaking to my daughter. I said, there are probably three or 400 books in my personal library that I've yet to read. So that first, that gives me great angst because there's all this knowledge that I've yet to learn. But also paradoxically, it makes me very excited because the mere thought of thinking that one day, God willing, Darwin willing, if I've had the ability to read all these books, my mm. God, am I going to be a fuller human being, a more profound human being. So whatever knowledge I have now is nothing compared to the knowledge that I will have if and when I finish reading those 300 books. Guess what? That made me immediately happy. The fact mm. that there was mm. all this knowledge that I had yet to consume made me happy. Now, I don't think many people would say that, and that's regrettable. I wish there was a way for us to sell that cerebral desire in a bottle. I think it would make people a lot happier. Yeah, I'm also wondering in the back of my mind, two, uh, two things. One, if that curves upward, like 
the more you read, the more your capacity increases uh, and the happier you could become. But, you know, when you were talking about ac academicians and narrow band pursuits, one of the things that I've noticed, and I think that this is a fairly recent phenomenon, and you write about this in your book, you write about fragility and anti-fragility in your book. Um, and, and I was wondering if you could draw the line for me, please, between fragility or anti-fragility and happiness. So define what that is and draw the line. Right. So anti-fragility, I mean, the term itself was popularized by Nassim Taleb, a fellow Lebanese. But of course, the, the idea has existed for many, many thousands of years. So for example, in the chapter on, uh, so the chapter is called uh, On Persistence and the Anti-Fragility of Failure. That's the chapter in my book. Okay. I start with the epigraph from Seneca. Seneca, okay, the, the Roman uh, Stoic. So the and so let me explain what anti-fragility is using the, the, the example from Seneca. So he basically says, I'm paraphrasing his words. He says that strong trees are those that have been exposed to severe wind stressors because then their trunks and their roots are deeply ingrained within the thing, right? Whereas the trees that have not been exposed to strong wind stressors will be brittle. Well, right there, that's the concept of anti-fragility, meaning that for many systems to fully operate at maximal potential, they require these stressors. So let's take an example that I originally discussed in my previous book, In the Parasitic Mind. It's Great book, by the way. Well, thank you so much, Pete. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, th this is called the hygiene hypothesis from evolutionary medicine, yeah, which basically yeah. says, look, Take two sets of kids. One set of kids has grown up in a completely allergen-free environment, right? The other set of kids have grown up on a farm with pet dander, with dust, with feathers. Guess what? The kids who have grown up on the farm with a lot of allergens end up having many fewer autoimmune diseases, most typically, say, asthma. Why? Because your respiratory system expects to be exposed to these stressors so that it can build and develop the optimal response to it, right? So you need to be exposed to stressors. You need to be anti-fragile or else you could never embark on many of the incredible journeys in life that will ultimately lead to purpose and meaning if at the first evidence of some obstacle or failure, you go into a fetal position, sucking your thumb and crying that you're a failure. And in that section of the, of that, of the chapter, the way that I decided to demonstrate the power of what I was saying there is to look for the all time greats or the goats, the, the greatest of all time in many different disciplines, and then discuss very briefly their stories of rejection and how they were anti-fragile to failure. So Lionel Messi, greatest soccer player of all time, was told he's too small and frail to even be a professional soccer player, let alone the greatest soccer player ever. Michael Jordan was reject was was cut from his sophomore high school team. Okay, uh, J.K. Rowling was rejected by every publisher until the final one who accepted her. Uh, Steven Spielberg was rejected from USC School of Yeah. Uh, School, not once, not twice, but three times. So imagine if each of these greats, and there are many, many others, had decided, you know what? That's true. I'm a failure. I I'm, I'm packing it in. It's not worth it. We wouldn't have been enriched by their incredible artistry and talent. So you can't truly be existentially happy in the great grand pursuits of life if you don't have the anti-fragility to overcome these failures. Yeah, it's interesting about the hygiene hypothesis. I, I'm I'm always very careful when I talk about medical things since I have no training. And I have Crohn's disease, and I've often the hygiene hypothesis has been offered as a speculation for that. And I think if you would have went, you know, time traveled back to my mom and told her, "Hey, expose him to more, <laughs> you know, crap, more stuff on floors, etc." I I don't think she she would have done that. But the reason that I mention that is because I'm thinking about what's happened in the academy recently and I'm thinking about how people are have this everybody talks about the system so I'll talk about the system this it's almost like the system 
has made people allergic to ideas that contradict anything that they already believe in. And one of the things that I found fascinating is in your book, the kind of fragility that has overcome academia. So how do you get people to value not being anti-fragile who are fragile? Because right. they would have to go through that process of, oh, wow, good point, or kind of an intellectual humility. I'm thinking of like jujitsu in that point. Like, but but the people who engage in jujitsu want to go through the process. But academicians, I don't think want to go through the process. So how do you get them to value to value not to, to value anti-fragility, which means engaging in some kind of a dialectic when they don't want to do it in the first place? Yeah, that that's a that's it's it's, it's a sixty four thousand dollar question. So I argue that you certainly can't be creating the zeitgeist within the university ecosystem that promulgates the following ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, opposing ideas is a form of violence, right? Uh, uh, by the way, when you said, when, when you took my hygiene, hypo, it's not my hygiene hypothesis, but when you took my example yeah. of hygiene hypothesis and applied it to academia, that's exactly what I had done in the parasitic mind because then I analogized and said, well, imagine now, you're talking about instead of asthma or your 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 pulmonary system talk about your critical thinking right your reasoning well your reasoning expects for it to be maximally flourishing to be exposed to opposing ideas that's how Correct. you learn to be a good debater so if you remove that th that's akin to removing the allergen in the asthma case I become a much better debater if I stand up in front of a hostile crowd, expecting 100%. them to have a hundred, right? By the way, that's how I developed in, in chapter seven of the parasitic mind. I The chapter is titled how to seek truth. And there I talk about nomological networks of cumulative evidence, mm. which is the idea that when I am trying to demonstrate to you the veracity, the, how veridical my position is, here's what I try to do when I'm building these nomological networks of cumulative evidence. I'm going to drown you in a tsunami of distinct lines of evidence in support of my position. I'm going to get you data from across cultures. I'm going to get you data from across time periods. I'm going to get you data from across animal species. I'm going to get you data from across disciplines. So imagine it's a triangulation process but it's an orgiastic epistemological triangulation. It's not methodological triangulation. It's right. bringing you data from every possible nook and cranny of the known knowledge world. And if it all converges to my position being right, guess what? You're going to keep your mouth shut and you're going to accept my position. And yeah, you, let me, let me, let me pause right, you right. Please, let me, let me please, pause you because I think this is so important. Wouldn't you need one more thing to that? Sure. Wouldn't you need to know opposing data points, evidence, and arguments against it and why those had potential flaws in it? Like, would, so you'd have to be aware of the other side or or you could just be presenting, you know, a kind of parallel infrastructure of knowledge. I, I got you. But so here's what I do. In, in building my nomological network, I build it, as a rebuttal to some of those opposing positions. Uh, so let me give okay, you a that solves right. You, right, you right, see right, it, yeah, but yeah. but th this sounds too abstract and philosophical. So let me concretize it with a specific example. Okay. So let's suppose now I want to build you, Pete, a nomological network yeah. for the following: sex-specific toy preferences are not socially constructed. There is a biological universal reason why little boys prefer certain toys and little girls prefer certain toys. Now, the opposing position, so to your question, is that no, toy preferences are socially constructed. As a matter of fact, that's how you start with the cascade of gender role specialization that the patriarchy... 100%. So, so, 100%. Now, so now I've got that contraposition that I know all my hostile audience members are holding to. Now I'm going to build my nomological network precisely targeting that opposing position. So yeah. how would I do that? Right. I'll just give you a few if I, or unless you want to interject before I do. No, I just, I just had a quick thought. So, so to, to build that nomological network, you don't, you can't do what the creationists do. 
Like you just can't start with certain assumptions and then look for data in your epistemic landscape to support this assumptions that you start. You have to do what you said. Exactly. You have to do exactly what you said. And if you, because if you don't do what you said, you dig yourself deeper into delusion because you justify the points. You, you become doxastically closed. You become more convinced that the things that you say are true because you're seeking them out to begin with, as opposed to the way that you've offered. Correct. Exactly right. And that's why, by the way, just to, to talk about the point of, you know, the create, you mentioned creationists, right? Yeah. Did you say creationists? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So one of the reasons why I don't debate creationists, I know that Richard Dawkins is famous for saying that is yeah. precisely because I know that there'll be no good faith uh, attempt from my creationist opponent to actually process and internalize my nomological network. When I'm building my nomological network, he or she is going to go, la, 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 I can't hear you. So therefore, no amount of tsunami of evidence that I build for you is ever going to sway you. So, so the reason why I don't debate creationists is not because I am haughty and elitist and they're not worthy of my time, because I know that there is no intellectually honest place where we can meet to even have the conversation. But let's let's go back yeah. so yeah. To, to concretize that uh, toy preference story. So what would be some of the evidence I would need to a mass for you. You are, let's suppose you, Pete, you're a strong social constructivist. You say that toy preferences are a complete social construction. Okay, yeah. so let's go. Let's let's oh, start. Oh, I thought you were asking me. I was going to tell no, you. No. Oh, do you, do you have some? Do you have some? Well, I would things? tell you what. It, I mean, if you, if, if I could put myself in that position, but I'll put. I can put myself in that position as someone who's not closed-minded and someone who is actually open to evidence. So, at one level of granularity, I think I. Uh, devices as a primary, secondary, and tertiary system, you would need some kind of cross cross cultural data. But my response to that would be, well, everybody watches American TV, and they're all social constructs, and we're just exporting our social constructs by a form of neo colonialism. So you'd have <laughs> to find regions of the world that weren't exposed to specifically American TV. So you just did exactly yeah. you're answering the question you had asked me, which is preempt what you think your most staunch detractor is going to do and be the architect of the nomological network to address Correct. each of these points. And if I've done, if I've been a good architect of the nomological network, you're done. I'm, I'm, I'm burying you. So let's do it. Okay. Number one, okay. how about I get you data from developmental psychology where developmental psychologists know the exact cognitive, the, the exact age at which a child is able to learn through socialization. And therefore, I'm going to get you children who are in the pre-socialization stage of their cognitive development. So by definition, it could not be social construction that manifests their toy preferences. And I could show you that those infants already exhibit those sex-specific toy preferences. The only reason that could be the case is if their parents weren't imbued with the idea of certain gender constructs. And if, if I were arguing this, I'd say, well, those are just artifacts of what the parents want and they just want the toys. They're just reading cues from the parents. Okay. But, but remember, uh, if, if, if by reading cues, you're incorporating that within the general socialization process, I've selected for infants who are too young to be able to process those cues. Right. Okay. And I'm going to leave aside the ridiculous restriction and, and just accept by fiat that that's the case. Okay. So that would be a, that, that would be a solid data point. So hold on. Right. So now, so the way you usually, you build a nomological network is you put the, the, the phenomenon that you're trying to amass the evidence for in the middle mm -hmm. as a circle. And then you build these square right. boxes of different lines of evidence. So right now I've got one box from developmental psychology that says, again, just to remind our viewers, Children who are in the pre-socialization stage of their cognitive development already exhibit those sex-specific toys. Okay, that's a nice finding, but I'm not even remotely close to, to finishing. Right. Okay. That, that, that one, okay, so that's the other thing. That one data point, I do not think that would be sufficient to warrant belief. Exactly. That's why I call it a tsunami of evidence, right? This right. is not a little, little meek river. This is right. going to be a tsunami, right. a gargantuan tsunami. All right, here we go. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm going to now get you data from vervet monkeys, from rhesus monkeys. Oh, look at, oh, you put up the thing. I can't see. Oh, yeah, you got, there you go. There you go. You've got the, you've got the nomological network. I love it. 
Uh, so now I'm going to get you data from vervet monkeys, rhesus monkeys, and chimpanzees showing you that they exhibit the same sex-specific toy preferences. So this is in evolutionary biology. It's called the homology, right? Yeah. It's a, homology, it's, a yeah. common, it's a common trait or behavioral pattern that exhibits common descent, uh, common ancestry, okay? So now you can't say that also vervet parent monk, uh, you know, parents of vervet infants are exhibiting those same sexist patriarchal cues. Okay, so already I feel as though I am hitting the proverbial death nail or right. epistemological new, but I'm not going to stop there, Pete. We've got okay, a lot hold, more. Okay, go ahead. I know. So we so now okay. This is I think this is really important. So this is why when people want to hold on to a belief, they have to deny biology. They don't deny gravity. They don't deny electromagnetism. They don't deny other uh, pure phenomena, the physics, what have. You. They always go after biology and they always go after evolutionary biology. I mean, this is what gender studies is built on is biology denialism, but it's built on that so that they can retain the very conclusions that they started off, that they started with in the beginning. And so I think it's essential as we continue this conversation that I have the posture of somebody who's not a deranged gender studies lunatic. Like I have the posture of somebody who's a reasonable, sane person, open to evidence open open to revising my belief uh, and, and matching the uh, not extending my belief beyond the warrant of of the evidence and looking at what you present that itself is an attitude that i see absent wholesale in any department ending in the word studies but i'm going to be the reasonable person you construct the network i'm now looking at out of uh, you know bonobos orangutans or what have you and i'm like wow that that right there is a very significant data point very Let's significant okay so we've got developmental psychology check we've got comparative psychology which is comparing across different animals check right okay how about i get you data i remember earlier you preempted by saying oh i can get you data from different cultures but then you could say that all the cultures are prone to the same socialization or cultural imperialism, blah, blah, blah. Well, I can get you data where I can control for that. I can get you sub-Saharan nomadic tribes where they absolutely have not been exposed to that and they exhibit the exact same preferences. I can get you data from Sweden, which is the country that oh, yeah, has yeah, tried yeah. to run yeah. the gender neutral experiment for 40 years. So if there's yeah. ever been a field experiment to try to eradicate those preferences, Sweden is it. And that study has been done where yeah, the least, Swedish paradox. Yeah, exactly. So the, so the Swedes, uh, so, the, so they ran a study in Sweden by looking at the actual toys in boys and girls bedrooms. And they are just as sex specific, if not more so than the rest of the world. So, okay. So that's another data point. I can get you data from pediatric endocrinology where now this is a mouthful. So let me first state and I'll explain. So there is a, a, this, an endocrinological disorder called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which when little girls suffer from it, it masculinizes some of their physical traits and, and behavioral patterns. So girls who have congenital adrenal hyperplasia then exhibit toy preferences that are perfectly reversed, that are exactly like those of boys. Oh boy, social constructivists, the noose is coming tighter around your neck, but I'm not done yet. How about I get you? Uh, you might say, <laughs> hey, Dr. Saad, great job. You really seem to be convincing me, but you suck. You know why? Because you didn't get me data across across time periods. How do we know that? Yeah, 2000- that was just, I was literally just thinking that. Yeah. How about yeah. to? Oh, don't worry, blue haired Taliban from Oberlin College. I've got that data for you. There is a an analysis of funerary monuments in ancient Greece and ancient Rome where children are depicted playing with toys and they exhibit the exact same sex specific toy preferences several thousand years ago. So look what I so you see how yeah, that yeah. nomological network is destroying you. Yeah. So now, by the way, let's link that to happiness. Well. I mean, it wasn't meant to be necessarily a thing, but I want to link it to happiness. When I go into a very hostile crowd to lecture, and I know that I will be faced with crowds, I'm very calm. And I walk with a lot of swagger and a lot of smiling. Why? 
because I've done the background homework of building my nomological network. So when I walk into that room and I say what I say, I know there's going to be some hostile people in the crowd, but I know they certainly haven't built their nomological networks. I'm going to have built mine. You won't have built yours. I'm going to destroy you and I'm going to leave happier than when I first came. Yeah. Okay. So this is really important. So I actually saw that firsthand, uh, you field hostile questions in, in Vegas again, but I want, I want to talk about that. So a rational sane person would say, wow. Okay. So this is what I would say. Well, I, well, I won't put it on myself. This is what a rational sane person would say. Well, I never thought of that. Like, that's really interesting. Uh, I'm not ready to change my mind yet, but I will look at your data. And I, I appreciate the fact that you presented that you've given me a lot to think about. That is a posture that sane people who value reason and evidence take who are not ideologues. If you are not an ideologue, that's what. Now let's look at the posture that's overcome the culture. Exactly. Right. Or I'm offended by that or bring the bullhorn into the, you know, interrupt Dr. Sad when he's trying to speak, yell at him, call him a Nazi, call him a fascist, call him a pig, call him a vile, despicable Jew. And people are anti-Semitic. I've seen it with you online. Oh, yeah. I've, I've seen it with my own eyes. Right. So it, it moves from any kind of reasoned position. So they they throw reason and evidence out the window. But in but. I think that's a mechanism to keep the belief in place. So they won't have to do the intellectual work to consider what you just said. They they'll just call you a Nazi, right? Exactly. That's so much easier than looking at. Cause we know, cause if I start with my belief, the childhood toys are so that, that, that sex itself is a construct, which is an even more insane idea, right? Uh, it's way post Butlerian notion. That, and, and I'm just, so, so I guess, so we have multiple things going on now. I don't know if it's possible in any short-term intervention to change that culture, to make people who are so unshakably committed to the idea that gender is a, that everything is a construct. That's why the conceptual penis, the penis is a construct. Literally everything with these people is a construct. Uh, thanks for mentioning that in your first book. In the, in the, the, the <laughs> mind. I have a whole section on that. Yeah, I know. I know you have a whole section. It's good. Um, so I don't know what, how we intervene beside building new things like the university of Austin. I don't know how we intervene in, in the system. But the second thing is relating that to happiness. It would seem to me that if one has done the intellectual work to do what you've done, then happiness would be a byproduct of that, would it not? Exactly. And that, that speaks to my earlier point when I mentioned uh, Frankel's uh, quote, right? It's not the willful pursuit of happiness that is the mechanism at play. It's the pursuit of other goals, which- 100%. If, yeah, which if instantiated properly, then I wake up and go, oh my God, I'm happy. Like, look, this conversation right now, is a intellectual tango, right? I mean, we are, right? I mean, think about it, right? What, what, what's beautiful about Argentinian tango? There are these two people who are moving in, in sync in a way that you and I can probably not move that way, right? Well, right. we are doing right now an intellectual tango. It's a beautiful thing. I, I put out a few ideas. You explore them. You synthesize them. You kept back at me. We're dancing. We're cerebrally dancing. Well, guess what? That makes me happy, right? Like, I don't walk away from this conversation saying, oh, man, I wasted my time with Pete Bogosian. My wife will ask me how to go, <laughs> and I'm going to say, my God, it was amazing. I had so much fun. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. It's very kind. Right? So that, but but that's, yeah. by the way, that speaks, if I can segue to another topic, that speaks yeah. to another chapter in my book, the happiness book, where I talk about life, uh, life as a playground. And I yeah. basically argue that the, the drive to play is as innate as the drive to go to the bathroom, the drive for sex, the drive for food, the drive for water, the drive for uh, shelter. So imagine if we're going to put it in the parlance of Abraham Maslow with his hierarchy of needs, uh, it's right there in the first level. We need to play. But oftentimes people think of play as a temporary developmental step in childhood mm -hmm. And then you grow out of play, right? So in the same way that we're all born with temporary teeth, which fall out, and then our permanent teeth come in, you, you outgrow, you drop your play. No, 
No, play is a lifelong thing. Science is a, is the ultimate form of play. It's the highest order of cerebral play. What's what's science, Pete? It's take it's puzzle making. It's taking a bunch of variables. You don't know exactly which ones are linked to which other ones, and hopefully, I'm going to develop a coherent theoretical story to try to predict which is linked with what else. But isn't that what we do with a 1,000 piece puzzle? So, one of the reasons why I was motivated to write this book, to to our earlier point, why did I write this book is because everybody's always telling me, you always do these crazy things. You're playing, you're self-flagellating. I don't know if people saw my latest. Did you see my latest uh, clip with Jordan Peterson? Do you know what I'm talking about? No. Oh, so Jordan Peterson was recently mandated by, uh, oh yes, yes. You know, by the Ontario College of Psychologists to take mandatory... College of Psycho Psychologists of Ontario. Ontario, thank you. Uh, mandated to take social media training so that he could become a, a better person. <laughs> so I put out a clip. So again, there are many ways that you could respond. In my typical, if I may say, inimitable God style, I use yeah. mockery and satire. Right, I, right. I put out a kind of like a press release. It was, of course, completely satirical, but yeah. a lot of people were fooled by it at first. I said, well, I'm delighted, honored, and humbled to tell everybody that the Ontario Psychology, whatever co college of psychologists, yeah, yeah. has chosen me as the tutor <laughs> for the journey of Jordan Peterson. And then I just start self-flagellating the shit out of myself as I go through the life <laughs> lesson. Okay. Well, that's play, right? Right. The, the, the real message here is an incredibly serious one, right? Like, should a society be having its order, like order of psychologists in this case, mandating that its members go through Orwellian you know, re-education lobotomy. That's a very, yeah. very serious but topic. And, and, and just parenthetically, the same people who are for uh, transitions, basically mutilation of children, the same people, <laughs> right? So I, I was going to say, because it's interesting, because when you were talking and I was thinking about this, it would have seemed to me until you mentioned play that happiness, you, you couldn't really have happiness unless you had hard work. And I know and I'm thinking about this as an N of one. I, I don't know the literature on this at all, just from my own extensive life at 57 anecdotal experience. Every time I've worked really hard on something and, and it's paid off, like uh, Reed is on his jujitsu journey. Like when I remember when I got my blue belt, that test was unbelievable. Like I had to wrestle with literally with everybody in the gym for like, I don't need like 90 minutes. I, I just, it was just so like happiness was, I was so happy. It was the byproduct of that. But then you started talking about play and I don't think that there's any hard work in play. So maybe it's not a single variable upon which happiness is based, but it's a kind of either a conflagration of variables or discrete variables. I, I don't, I don't know, but the play thing is really interesting, isn't it? Like, yeah. Uh, the, the evolutionary yeah. angle, by the way, there, there are some very interesting evolutionary theories to explain the, the existence and importance of play. The general argument, it, it slightly varies across species, but the general argument is that play is a practice run of evolutionarily relevant behaviors, right? So, for example, when you have predator species or prey species, they will when they are juvenile, they will engage in play patterns that mimic that dynamic between prey and predator, precisely because, in a sense, like how we were talking earlier about how the allergens kickstart your immune system, that play behavior is kickstarting the, the patterns that will be adaptive later in life when it's really literally life or death or you're trying yeah, to find the mate. So, yeah, so play is such a fundamentally important way. Now, Incidentally, if I can get personal, please. I, I've had people tell me, not very few, but people that I, I would otherwise uh, listen to, say, "Oh, but don't you think that when you do all your, you know, very funny stuff?" And yes, I agree. You, you're hilarious, and you, you have such a nice sense of humor, and blah. Don't you think that that, uh, you know, uh, demeans your uh, authority as a professor? And I say unequivocally no, Interesting, because yeah. first of all, it takes incredible self-assuredness to be able to put yourself out that way, where I wear the 
the pink wig where I'm self-flagellating. How many other professors you know who don't do that? But that means that I'm a complex creature, that I am yeah. authentic, that yeah, I'm yeah. multifaceted. Yeah. If the only way you take me seriously at Stanford is if I never joke around and play, then I probably don't want to lecture at Stanford. That means you don't understand the richness of the human experience. So I don't think that playing makes you any less of a serious person. Life is very serious. That's why we have to play. Yeah, it's interesting. I've taken a lot of grief over the years for saying that lectures should also be fun. Yeah. Uh, and it seems so obvious that if they're fun, people will be more engaged. And and I remember one colleague really giving me a hard time or grief over that. Hey, before I go on, I've had you for almost an hour. Do, do you have a, do you have some time to answer super chats? Is that Let's cool? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. All right. Reed. Uh, Reed is the man. He's going to put on some super. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> That's. <laughs> hey, I Reed. Love, Reed, can that. you put a picture of Fierce Sally, please? Do you know who Fierce Sally is? Oh, I certainly do. Fierce Sally. Reed will kick that up. By the way, where are you now? You in I'm uh, in Montreal. We, ju I ju mm. we just returned from a three-week trip to uh, California. A bit of time in San Francisco and most of the time in Orange County. Uh, yeah. Where are you? Uh, well, I'm in... I'm I'm in an undisclosed location oh, okay, at the moment. Right, right, okay. I, I, had to, I had to move out of Portland because I had... Um, I've had some, to be very blunt with you, some security concerns among other things. And so I'm, I'm at an undisclosed location, but I travel like nine or 10 months a year now. So it's interesting. And I'm oh, like, nice. I'll no no regret. Yeah. If I may ask about you having made the professional decision that you have, correct? <laughs> oh my God. I can't believe I didn't do it sooner. It's like literally the best thing that ever happened to me. Oh, oh there's fierce Sally. There's my girl. There she is. She's there hot. She is. If you don't mind me saying so. She is hot. I, I'm I'm attracted to her myself. <laughs> oh, great to see the dream team. Really excited for this. Scott Jaram, ten dollars or ten pounds. Thank you, Scott. We appreciate it. By the way, I, I'll be back in London pretty soon. Uh, at are you going to Peterson's Ark thing? Oh, you know, I was invited. Uh, yeah. It's tough because of my teaching schedule. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I, as of now, I'm leaning towards a no. But what, what do you convince me otherwise? I'll, if I'll go. I'll, I'll yeah. I'm going. Everybody who's just about anybody I know is going. I understand that your teaching schedule is. I mean, what are you going to do? Because then you exactly. get back and the stress of grading exactly. and everything is overwhelming. All right, Reed. What's the next one? Sam Getty Smith, five pounds. Is there? humor that reaches the woke good question really good question lots of jokes either reveal shared axioms or play with them what is left in woke queer space that we agree on so is there humor that reaches the woke good question yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question i actually discussed this general point in my previous book you, you said your first book it wasn't it's actually my yeah i know I, I caught myself sorry yeah yeah it's my fourth book but right. uh in the in the previous book in the parasitic mind i have a section on you know, comedy and the power of satire and so on. And I refer to an amazing movie that you might remember, uh, Name of the Rose, 1985 or 86. Yep. It's the story of a Benedictine monk who is sent to a monastery during the, I think it was the Dark Ages, not the Middle Ages. I think it was the Dark Ages, maybe 12th century or 13th century, to, to investigate a series of suspicious deaths where these monks were dying with blue marks on their tongue. Do you remember that? Do you remember this? Yeah, the vaguely, but yeah, yeah, very vaguely, but yeah. Now, you might say, well, what the hell is he getting talking about? How does this relate to this question? Well, this it turns out, spoiler alert, if you're planning on watching this movie, which you should, it's a classic, then turn away now because I'm about to spoil it for you. It turns out that the head monk had found the, a copy, I think maybe Poetics of Aristotle, where he talks about comedy and so on, and he thought that comedy, fun things, laughter was the work of the devil, Satan. So in order to make sure that no monks would go into the forbidden library and read the works of Aristotle, he, he put a poison at the bottom of each page so that when you're flipping the pages, it would then end up killing you. Now, why am I using this example, of course? Because here's an example where, okay, he wasn't woke, but he was an ideologue ideologues don't like humor ideologues don't like laughter that's why dictators kill satirists first because the greatest Correct. threat to the dictator is not the guy with the big muscles 
It's the guy with the sharp tongue. We got to get rid of him. So no, the woke are not funny, and what a dreadful way to live life. Yeah, that's correct. Andrew Doyle, my 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 good friend, has yes. uh, spoken about that. Uh, and all right, cool. Read next question. I think it was a great answer. Dom for five dollars. Gad. Oh, that's Dom. Dom. Dom is a member of my organization. Gad, do you believe our institutions deliberately push us toward unhappiness to then sell us happiness? Good question. I mean, it depends which institution. It's difficult to talk about the institutions. It, it makes it sound too grand and conspiratorial. Uh, generally speaking, I think that it there isn't this kind of willful thing that is being impl implied by your question. I think there are specific idea pathogens, to use the language from my last book, that proliferate for reasons that we can get into. And then those idea pathogens, which originally arise for, quote, noble reasons, is what leads us to unhappiness. So I don't think there is kind of a group of evil doctor evils that are sitting and, and doing wah, 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 what you're saying. But I think that that ends up being what happens. But it, I don't think it's willful. Yeah. I Yeah. All right. Good. Uh, anyone know how to get a signed copy of The Parasitic Mind? <laughs> well, so I don't know if there are still any copies that are left, but Premier Collectibles, which is the company... That so premier p r e m i e r e so premier premier collectibles dot com. If you enter that side, you'll get my last two books. I don't know if they've sold out on the parasitic mind. If they haven't, what I do is I sign a whole bunch of book plates, which they yeah, then yeah. put it. So hopefully you can get it there. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that, Erica E Lee for nine ninety nine. We know what Gad refers to as auditory jihad. <laughs> it includes things ranging from non lebanese Arabic to musicals. What are your ideas for gustatory and olfactory jihad? That's yeah. it. Wow. God, I'd love to answer question. that after you're finished, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, so let me first answer that. I'm going to link the answer to this question to the previous, uh, the two ago with the woke not being humorous and the importance of humor. Let me talk about auditory jihad for a second. This is a, you know, I use a lot of humorous hyperbolic language. It's just part of my colorful, you know, larger than life kind of personality. Uh, auditory jihad, I've used it, for example, to describe the Beatles or U2, right? Because to me, their their sound is so unbearable that I call yeah, it auditory I, jihad. I agree. I'm totally with, with you with the Beatles. Every time you tweet about that, I'm like, I couldn't agree more. Oh, thank you so much, Pete. Let me see more, more reasons for us to be great yes. friends. Uh, and the dog, the love of dogs. That, oh my God. How could you be happy in life without sharing your life with dogs? It's beyond me. Okay. But let, let me get back uh, be, before I answer the question about all, uh, what was it? Gustatory. And what was the other one? Uh, olfactory. Olfactory. Uh, let me mention an example that recently just happened that deals with auditory jihad and that deals with not having a sense of humor. So the day that my book was released, which is uh, July 25th of this past year, so a month ago, uh, the first show that I appeared on in person was Joe Rogan in Austin. We had a great conversation, as we always do. And, a, and a, I don't know, maybe halfway through the conversation, we were ch joking about accents that that we find unattractive. Well, it was mainly me who was doing that. So so I said, oh, you know, we just returned from Portugal. My family and I, we were on vacation there. I got to tell you, I don't find the Portuguese accent uh, very attractive. Then I went on to say, oh, when it comes to Hebrew, which is one of my the languages that I speak, uh, well, that's violently ugly. But now this next one is the one that got me into trouble. Oh, and when it comes to French Canadian accent, well, that's just an affront to human dignity. Okay. Uh -huh. Now that sentence has become a gadism because I refer to that hyperbolic sentence whenever I want to emphasize how much I dislike something. The Beatles are an affront to human dignity, right? Celine Dion is an affront to human dignity. Anybody who doesn't love Lionel Messi is an affront to human dignity. So now talking about the woke who are humorless. So some Quebec uh, woke journalist picks up that story, does an entire hit piece on Gad Sad, famous professor from Quebec, goes on the number one podcast and calls our society an affront to human dignity. For the next two, three weeks, it's the number one story in Quebec. I'm in every newspaper, every magazine, every television show. 
a million death threats, a million calls to get me fired because I made a joke about an accent. So that's not how you want to live life if you want to live a happy life. Okay, having said that, wow. are there forms of uh, gustatory uh, jihad? Dates are gustatory jihad. I despise dates. They look like sugary cockroaches. Oh, okay, so that's my only example. Olfactory jihad, well, just any kind of vile body odor, right? Sometimes you, you kind of walk by someone and you go, God damn, man, nobody gave you feedback about how you smell. I can't think of anything else, frankly. Yeah, I, I it vaguely reminds me. I was in um, China, and I remember just walking around China. God, some of those smells were so vile. They were like chemical, just and they were just like pervaded a block of the city. All right, we have you've been very generous with your time. Let's do one more Substack question. Up, oh, uh, oops, Gustav Louise for two bucks. The litmus test, Mister Saad. <laughs> Pele or okay. I don't know. I'm, I'm presuming I'm presuming that he listed Pele or Maradona, not meaning that those are the two greatest of all time. And please choose from one of these because, of course, better than both of them combined is Lionel Messi. So I'll leave that omission, presuming that he also agrees that Messi is untouchable. Pele or Maradona, it's a very tough one. And I know that this might bore you, Pete. You might not be into this, but for some of the viewers... I don't, I don't know, barely know what you're talking about, but keep okay. going. That is okay? If I, <laughs> yeah, sure. Go yeah. Ahead. Uh, Pele was a great Brazilian player who uh, won three World Cups, but I put it in quotes because one of the World Cups, he almost didn't play in it. He got injured, I think, by game one or something. So how did he win it? Uh, and he played in the World Cup when it was 16 teams, which is a very, very different reality than the World Cups today, which is truly a global thing that has 200 nations competing in it. OK, number one, I mean, but even the final World Cup today is 32 teams. It used to be 16. So it's, it's got nothing to do with the difficulty of winning the rest of his career. Other than when he came to the New York Cosmos, he was in Santos, where he was playing in some games. They were winning 8-0 and he would score six goals. Uh, that's not very impressive. I can also play against a U10 team and score 37 goals today. I'm being a bit facetious, but he didn't play in the top uh, leagues of Europe. Not, not to imply that the South Americans aren't good, but it's a completely different reality. Maradona uh, was out of this world, but for too short a period of time. So from about 86 to 90, Maradona was incredible, including his winning the World Cup, but he didn't do it for enough years to be, you know, remotely as good as Messi. So I can't really tell. I would say Pele and Maradona are on equal footing. I, dude, I marvel at, at, that you know about that. Like, I just, I'm, I marvel. That's just like I have, I just came believe. But you know, jiu-jitsu. You know, jiu-jitsu. Well, well, yeah, I mean, I could, you know, I mean, but geez, at that level. But I don't even know it at that level. You know. Uh, you mentioned Rogan. R Rogan, uh, you, how many times have you been on Rogan? Like seven or something? Like something crazy? Uh, no, Six, nine, seven, nine. 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 Yeah, you've been on. Actually, he said that I've entered kind of the Hall of Fame level. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, I remember. So Rogan has this crazy thing where he, I mean, he has an encyclopedic knowledge of this stuff. All right, right Reed, well, let's be generous. Uh, gen Gad's been generous with his time. Jordan, 10 bucks. Thank you both for this. What's the best way to turn impossible conversations into playful conversations? That's good. How do we play with ideas that we have strong moral ethical reasons for believing? That's a really you, good question. That's fantastic. But do you want to, because impossible no, conversation seems no, to. No, no, you go far. This is your interview or conversation. <laughs> uh, look, coming into the, the, the tango in a way where you recognize that even if you hold deferring opinions from me, we can both still benefit from walking away, having hopefully each learn something that we didn't know prior to the conversation is the only way to do it. By the way, I sometimes don't live by that uh, maxim or the, the, the credo because I sometimes in my punchiness, my sarcasm, my satire, I can make the other person with whom I'm debating suddenly get very defensive because they feel as though I am mocking them. Where in reality... I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to mock the boundary condition of some of the lunacy that they're saying. But in doing so, 
I end up putting an end to an otherwise fruitful conversation. And I think that something now it's coming from a playful perspective. Yeah. But I recognize that me mocking you can oftentimes not be perceived as playful by you, but rather as demeaning to you. And so I'm trying to at times be mindful of this so that we don't lose the rhythm of our conversations, but you just have to have fun. Hey, we can have. Yeah, that's, 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 I think that's a lot of the problem with identity politics and issues that have identity level salience is that people think that the issues stick to themselves as opposed to just the issues. Uh, all right, Reed, what else we got? Uh, oh, so this is a subset question. How will our manner of psychological evolution change now that humans have come to modify the natural world to suit our needs rather than us being shaped to suit our environment? Yes, yes. Great question. So here you have to understand that the evolutionary adaptations that manifest themselves in us today are adaptive to... A, evolutionary environment that may or may not be relevant today. This is, by the way, in evolutionary psychology called the mismatch hypothesis. So, for example, you, all of us in this chat have evolved gustatory preferences for fatty, high-dense, high-calorie foods. That That's is me. perfectly adaptive in the environment of caloric scarcity and caloric uncertainty. In the environment of today where we have plentitude, that could become maladaptive and it could lead to colon cancer and heart disease and uh, you know diabetes and the rest of it. So the reality is that it takes a very long time for a contemporary environment to exist for long enough for the selection pressure to operate. So it's not as though, so let me give you a concrete example. Yeah, please. Today we have DNA paternity tests. So you could say, the threat of paternity uncertainty is no longer relevant because we could do the test. That doesn't mean that men's psychology has suddenly removed our deep, deep distrust of cuckoldry and our negative response to being cuckolded, right? Just because we now have DNA paternity tests, because it's going to take many, many, many generations for that reality to exist, for the selection pressure to select it out. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. hundred percent. Yeah. That's it. So, you know, it's, I'm always struck when I speak to people who have deep, deep domain specific expertise, how that gives them a window into the world that I don't have, like how that, that, so you must see through the filters, through your education, you must see things and make connections so much more clearly Oh, I love I'm, that you asked that question. First of all, thank you for, yeah. the, for the compliment. Yeah. So the answer, if I can... You know, Please, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yes, it does allow me to see the world in a very different way, but for two reasons. Reason one is what you said, having a lot of not deep knowledge in many areas allows you to unlock certain uh, landscapes that otherwise would have been invisible to you. But secondly, I am a pathologically synthetic thinker, meaning I try to create synthesis across many different domains, or to use a term that I love that I've been trying to popularize it, following the lead of E.O. Wilson. E.O. Wilson wrote an amazing book, which I want, every, I, I should be only promoting my book here, but in, my purity doesn't allow me to only do that. You should go out and buy E.O. Wilson's Consilience, oh, Unity uh, yeah, of yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so what is consilience, guys? Consilience is exactly what the subtitle says, unity of knowledge, meaning, for example, physics is more consilient than sociology, not because physicists are smarter than sociologists. It's because they have a unified, coherent uh, tree of knowledge, which all physicists can agree on as core knowledge, right? So now creating consilience across Social sciences and natural sciences is exactly what I do when I try to link evolutionary biology to economic behavior, right? Economics lies in the social sciences. Evolutionary biology lies in the natural sciences. I'm trying to create a bridge between the two. So I think my ability to see things clearly and identify patterns comes, number one, from hopefully deep and broad knowledge, but number two, because of a synthetic mindset. Wow, there's so there's so much there's so much there to unpack, but I want to be I want to be um, my, mindful of your time. I do, I do want to ask this because I've been curious. 
I think I know the answer to this, but why do you think that there are so many attacks on evolutionary psychology? Oh, I love that question. Oh, and thank you for putting that book up. I, I got to tell you, Consilience is, I would, pr I'm probably going to put it as in my top 10 books of all times oh. of having shaped my own academic thinking. Because as I read that book, I said, wait a minute, here's this incredible mind telling me exactly how my brain works, which is constantly trying to build bridges. I love this guy. And one of my great regrets, by the way, we, we didn't talk about one, one of the ending chapters of my happiness book is about how to live life with minimal regrets. One of my great regrets is that I wasn't able to uh, have a chat with E.O. Wilson before he passed uh, away. Uh, did you have a chat with him? Uh, no, no, I've never spoken with him. Okay, but you, but you you know who he is. Oh, of course, I've read all the stuff. Of course, of, yeah. of course. Okay, so sorry. What was what was what was I? I asked. Oh, why do you why do you? Yeah, last thought. Why do you think that evolution? Oh, evolution has. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Why, yeah. So, I've actually written extensively about this. Uh, the he, before I answer that, here's the interesting thing: evolution. People on the right are more likely to hate evolutionary psychology people on the left are more likely to correct hate. so correct. it's not as though parasitic thinking is reserved for only one political aisle it's that the the parasite manifests itself in different ways depending on my political orientation now evolutionary psychology people hate it for different reasons let's let's discuss a few number one there is a very very deep aversion uh, this is called the reticence effect for people to ascribe the same mechanisms that explain the behaviors of all other animals to human, the human animal, right? So surely, Dr. Saad, you're not saying that this behavior that the mosquito does and the zebra does and the dog does is also what explains our behavior. That's why people hate when Jordan Peterson uses the lobster example with dominance hierarchies. What are you saying, moron, that we are lobsters? So number one, people don't like, we are unique in people's eyes. What makes us human is that we transcend our biology. Mm -hmm. That's what makes me different from the mosquito, according to them. So that's one reason. Second reason, uh, by the way, of course, all of these reasons are pure bullshit, and I've offered extensive rebuttals to them. As a matter of fact, in this book right here, I, I can't, no, which way? This way? This book, The Consuming Instinct, I list all the detractors of EP and I offer EP evolution psychology and I offer a rebuttal. Let me do a few more. Uh, evolution in general, and therefore, in, in as a follow-up, evolution psychology became tarred with its wrong relationship with a whole bunch of really nefarious political movements, right? So British class elitists said which then became known as social Darwinism, they said, hey, there's a natural struggle between the classes. We're the upper class. You're the lower class. You lost the battle. Hey, that's a natural struggle. If you die from tuberculosis in your sh shitty neighborhoods, who cares? That's just Darwinian. Of course, Darwin didn't say any such thing. Okay, here comes the Nazis. Hey, there's a natural struggle between races. We're the Aryans, goddamn Jews and gypsies. Let's get rid of them. Hey, that's just natural. That's just a natural struggle of races is Darwinian. What's the problem? Darwin said it's okay. So because a bunch of Cretans misappropriated Darwinian theory for their nefarious purposes, it became a taboo subject. Don't yeah, mention yeah. Darwin. That's evil. Yeah, I don't know yeah. why it's evil, but I know it's somehow Nazism. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Feminists dis despise evolutionary <sighs> psychology because, of course, evolutionary psychology does say that we are a sexually dimorphic species right, with right. very clear and recurring evolutionary-based sex differences. No, not all differences are socially constructed. Postmodernists hate evolutionary psychology because evolutionary psychology says that there are human universals. Of course, postmodernism says there are no universals other than the one universal that there are no universals. Yeah, so yeah. for all sorts of reasons, evolutionary psychology picks at my favorite pet dogmatic ideology, and I will not tolerate those evolutionary psychology bullshitters. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. It's yet it's I, I love the explanatory model of being a pathogen. Yeah. And I think many people, especially now with social media, tribal tribalism algorithms pushing us, we tend to think of the other side as being quote unquote irrational. 
where right whereas in fact i think your example of evolution on the right and evolutionary psychology and it is a, a an almost unifying biology denialism i've i've always find it fascinating i could talk to you for for hours and hours uh, but i Thank do want to so be much. very mindful mindful of your time uh, i can tell before you, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but I, I'm not yeah. trying to blow the proverbial compliment smoke up your behind. Yeah. When we leave this chat and my wife asks me, how was it? I'm going to say it was one of the best chats I've had on this tour. So oh, that's so kind of you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm, I've, I've, uh, I'm trying to, so Reed uh, is the, the mastermind behind this. He's pushed me to have a channel. I'm trying to do a combination between an interview and a conversation. And so I see a lot of people who just do interviews. Uh, and so I'm trying. I'm trying to um, do, do both of those. So I appreciate that. A uh, couple things. So before we hang up, uh, don't, don't hang up. Stay on because it's going to upload. Where can people find your book? Where can people buy your book? What, tell us about your YouTube channel. A highly sure. successful Twitter account, etc. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so the sad S A A D, not S A D S. That's my last name. The sad truth about happiness: Eight Secrets for Leading the Good Life is out. It's been out for about a month. You can get it on Audible, audiobooks. You can get it in Kindle. You can get it physical. You can order it on Amazon, bookstores. It's it's available everywhere. Uh, my I have a website, gadsad.com, where you can link up with me in all sorts of ways. My uh, YouTube channel is The Sad Truth, S-A-A-D Truth. Uh, it's both on YouTube and on a uh, podcast. Uh, it is a combination of many different things. I also hold long form chats with all sorts of brilliant people. I've had Pete on a few times. Yep. Uh, I also just turn on the, the the laptop and start self flagellating, or I'll start wearing the pink, or I'll start hiding under the desk in full fear or whatever, right? So right. there's all kinds of content. Some of it very serious and professorial. Some of it completely satirical. Join, register, connect with me. Let's have fun. Wonderful. We appreciate it. And thank you so much for, for coming on Conversations with Peter Bogosian here. I'm, I'm uh, very fortunate to count you as uh, not just one of my friends, but one of my friend friendships of virtue. And I'm very grateful for that friendship. So thank you. Thank you so much, Pete. You too. Cheers. All right, everybody. Thanks.